Over the past couple of weeks, we have taken a look at Israel during the period of the judges. Near the end of Samuel's time as both God's prophet and judge of Israel, we see an Israel that desired to be like the other nations in the land. Israel didn't have a king, they had judges. But the elders of the people, as we'll see in our lesson today, and the people themselves, they desire for a king to rule over them. So in our Sunday School lesson this week, we take a look at what that meant. For Israel to want to be like the other nations in the land, for Israel to want a king to rule over them. So our lesson this week takes a look at the selection and the appointing of Israel's first king. This all came about when Samuel had gotten older. He desired to make his sons as judges over Israel, as we're told in the eighth chapter of 1 Samuel the third through the fifth verse. As we know, the Lord, he would raise up judges to help lead the people out of suffering. So this is actually an odd thing for Samuel to desire. The elders of Israel, they had no desire for Samuel's sons, who were wicked, by the way, to be judges. And so they asked Samuel to make a king to judge them as the other nations. While it made complete sense for Israel not to want Samuel's wicked sons to be judges over them, I would say to you that it made absolutely no sense for them, God's chosen people, to want to be like the other people living in the land the other people that did not know the Lord, that did not have a personal relationship with the Lord, that wasn't in fellowship with God. The other people in the land, they had not made a covenant with God, but Israel, they knew the Lord. Israel, they benefited from being in fellowship with the Lord. So it made absolutely no sense, which I suppose can tie into all of those that are a child of God today. We should not desire to ever be like the sinner. But yet here we are where many of us, we look at the center, we look at what the center has, and we wonder why has God not given to us as the center has received. Many of us, we become covetous, which we have to be very weary of doing. We, as God's children, we should never desire to be like the others who are sinful. So how do you think that makes the Lord feel? When he has provided for you and you look at the sinner, what the sinner has, and you covet what they have, how do you suppose that makes God feel? How do you think the Lord would feel about Israel desiring to be like the Gentiles when, again, Israel, they had a personal relationship with the Lord? How do you think all of this would make the Lord feel? Now, as we'll see there in that eighth chapter, the seventh through the ninth verse, we'll see that Samuel, he was not pleased. And We'll see where the Lord said to Samuel to just allow, permit them to have their king. He instructed Samuel, we'll see, to heed the voice of the people. Though Samuel was encouraged, he was instructed to let the people know about the behavior of the king who would reign over them in comparison to the Lord. Now there's a drastic difference between the rule of man and the rule of God. Think about this for a moment. The Lord, he is sovereign. God, he is all powerful, all knowing, everywhere at all times. The Lord, he is love. That is his nature. In his love, there is compassion. There is mercy. There is forgiveness. So God's rule over us, mankind, it is a rule that is of nothing but love, desiring the best for us. Whereas we, mankind, we are filled with sin. We are filled with selfishness, lust, and we don't have much compassion within us. We are always trying to compete with each other, always trying to tear each other down, trying to have more than the next person. So again, there's a difference between the rule of God and the rule of man. In Israel, they will soon learn that throughout the kingdom years. So 
The first verse of our lesson there in the ninth verse, it opens up by telling us about the first king of Israel. Again, the first king of Israel was Saul. Saul, he was of the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin was the youngest son of Jacob. And in fact, that tribe, it was the smallest of the tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes. Now the description of Saul, when you take a look at it there, it fits the idea of what a king was supposed to look like. He was handsome and he had the stature. He was taller than any other person of Israel. When the Lord was ready to move on from Saul and was ready to anoint David to be his king, he said to Samuel, don't judge by the outward appearance. You see, we, mankind, we always look at the outward. That is what we judge by. Whereas God, he's concerned about what is on the inside, the, the hidden man of the heart. The Lord, he judges the soul. And so that's what Samuel, when he went to David, again, wasn't supposed to look at that outward appearance. It was all about the heart. That is all that matters to the Lord. The lesson now skips over to the 10th chapter and the 17th and 18th verse where we'll see that Samuel, he brought the people together and he recalled what the Lord had done for Israel. God, Samuel said, had brought Israel out of the bondage of Israel. He also spoke about how the Lord had delivered the people in their days of oppression during the period of the judges. Yet Israel, they weren't appreciative of all that the Lord had done for them. They weren't grateful for the fact that they were living in the promised land. And so we'll see there in the 19th verse that Samuel, he points out that the people, they were rejecting all that God had done for them as he ruled over them. So this is a message that should have been hitting home for Israel. It should have made them stop and to think for a moment, to realize all that God had done for them, just how good the Lord had been to them. But we will see that Israel, they didn't stop and think for a second when it came to this new and exciting king that they were about to have rule over them. The people will see that they were waiting in anticipation to have a king like the other nation. They went through a process for the king to be selected and we'll see that the lots, they eventually fell on the family of Saul and he ended up being selected to come forward as king. But when this happened, Saul, he wasn't anywhere to be found. The people, they had to inquire of God where Saul was, and it was revealed that Saul, he was hiding among the equipment. So why was Saul hiding? Maybe he was a bit shy. Yes, Saul, he would grow into the typical behavior of a king during that time period, but at first, Saul, he was modest. He was one that was of great humility. So we'll see there in the 23rd and 24th verse that the people, they ran, they got Saul, and they brought him to where all the rest of the people were. And when the people were able to finally take a look at him, they saw a man that, again, he had the look of a king. They saw a man that had the stature of a king. And we'll see there that they shouted with great joy and they said, long live the king. Well, so much for all that the Lord had did for the people with all that the Lord had did for their forefathers as well. The people, they just didn't care because the people, they had their king. The people, they were no longer different from the other people that were living in the land. They were now just like them. And that excited them more than it probably should have. Now, this was honestly a very sad moment for Israel. Even after Samuel explained to the people the behavior of royalty, the people, they were happy to have themselves a king. Now, I do want to point out that not all the people were excited about this announcement. In fact, then the next verses, just outside of our lesson, we'll see where some actually rebelled and they asked, how can this man, how can he save us? And we're told there that they despised Saul from the very beginning. The biggest takeaway from our lesson this week is just how blinding covetousness, just how blinding wickedness, just how blinding sin can be. Again, the heart, it is deceiving. This is what the Lord said. It, it desires to, to do nothing but wickedness. And so you and I as believers today, we ought to be led by the Spirit. We have two contrary natures that are present within us that are always fighting and warring against one another. 
we have a nature that is of the spirit and then we have a nature that is of the flesh and they are contrary to one another as Paul spoke of and they're always battling they're always fighting each other the nature that is of the flesh it is blinded to the instructions of the Lord it just doesn't care and again when you aren't living in obedience to God's instructions you will never receive the blessings that the Lord has for you. You will just go blind. His blessings can be right there in front of you. But if you're coveting, if you're lusting of the flesh, you'll go right by. However, when you are obedient to the Lord's instructions, you go blind to sin, you go blind to wickedness. The blessing is right there in front of you. And that's what you strive for. And you will take possession of it. So, Again, our biggest takeaway from our lesson today should be that we move in the desire to take possession of the blessings that God has for us rather than the riches of this world. You don't have to be like the sinner. Yes, the sinner may have the riches of this world, but the riches that the Lord has for you, they are far greater. So I would suggest to all of you today, I would encourage to all of you today, live for the Lord. Don't live for the world. Don't live to be like the sinner. Live to be unique live to be the special treasure in God's eyes. Take possession, lay hold of the blessings that the Lord has for you. Be obedient to his instructions and this, love the Lord over everything.